Uh, it's on now. Okay. One, two. Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, I trust you're enjoying the festival, and I assume you've been watching some Yugoslav films in the program. And that's why you're here for um, a discussion between the curator of the program, uh, Mina Radovic, who's based in Scotland, uh, involved in a project called uh, uh, Liberating Cinema. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the best expert on, Itali uh, on uh, Yugoslav uh, cinema that we have in this country, uh, Sergio Grema Germani, and he's the author of multiple books on the subject in Italian, and I believe you can find some of them yes. in the library now. If, you're, uh, if, you, if you read Italian, please go and uh, check those books. So uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation and come back for the screening of uh, other uh, Yugoslav films in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Exan. Uh, I will start by um, just thanking everyone for coming, and I hope you're enjoying the films on the program. And thank you, Exan, and the whole directorial team um, at in Il Cine Mario Travato and the Cineteca Bologna, um, and all our participating archives, uh, including those in Belgrade, Zagreb, Ljubljana, and um, Skopje. Um, I'm very grateful, and I'm glad we can have this discussion with Sergio. Um, I will start by giving a bit of an introduction, kind of an um, overview, really, why I picked these films and kind of giving you a bit of background context, historical, cultural context. And then we'll have a conversation, kind of divided, looking at the history and culture of Yugoslav film, and then also like aesthetics and talking about its significance in relation to world cinema. So um, if I start straight away, one of the first films, uh, why I presented this program in this way, there's quite a rich silent heritage dating very to the beginning of film. But uh, the point when the industry is nationalized is after the Second World War. And that's when you start, when you first have major studios, uh, studio system essentially being built um, with a major studio in each republic, which includes Avala Film in Belgrade, Yadran Film in Zagreb, um, and uh, Trigo Film in Ljubljana, and so on. And there's uh, what's interesting that happens after the war is you do have a lot of socialist pictures, but the, they're all fascinating in their own way. And you have quite a few directors emerging, um, both in the classical period, really, and this is, the I would say, the 50s, and in the kind of period of the new Yugoslav film, which is the 60s, or Black Wave, as you might be familiar with it. Um, and why, we, why I selected this particular selection of films, I wanted to start with Tri Zgodbe, Three Stories, as a film, really, it's an interesting work um, by three kind of Slovenian, foremost Slovenian directors of the time. Um, and it's an interesting work because it kind of incorporates this traditional kind of idyllic um, Slovenian mountain setting, um, which was quite popular like in the 50s, but also connects it with this tradition of making the kind of films in three parts, triptychs, which kind of comes up. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yes. Uh, so, yes, the triptych um, kind of um, form which reoccurs in Yugoslav film and which is kind of a, one of the trademarks of the new wave as well. So one of the, f for some of the films like The City, which is made in, in the 60s, which, which was also the only banned film in Yugoslavia formerly, was also a kind of triptych by three directors. And that was also a popular form. So I thought it would be interesting to see this kind of film like Three Stories um, because it kind of incorporates both the traditional and kind of this new form of storytelling. But Sergio and I will talk more about this. Um, uh, also then, uh, when we speak about a film like Neo Kreci Se Sin, I Don't Look Back My Son, which connects nicely with the Ninth Circle. Um, it's, I included these because these are first and foremost very important films. Um, and then because they reveal kind of this uh, period of the most recent history at the time, which as our colleague Vjaran Pavlinic from Zagreb very um, nicely put in his introduction to the Ninth Circle, which was a dark period kind of um, during the Second World War. And these films essentially look at kind of um, the remembrance, the way of dealing with the systematic genocide that was perpetrated against Serbs, Jews, and Roma in the independent state of Croatia between 1941 and 1945. So, um, and these films deal with them in different ways. In Don't Look Back, My Son, you see a, almost a partisan narrative, and in The Ninth Circle, you see this relationship develop between a Croatian teen and a Jewish girl um, he marries to really save from the Holocaust. A film like, um, so th these are two, uh, again, wonderful films. Uh, a film like Zenit, on the other hand, uh, is a work that is based after the war and that looks at modernize, modernization and the 
countries' um, industrial industrialization. And because there were quite a few factory films made in Yugoslavia, including one called The Factory, <laughs> which is um, from 1950. So uh, I thought this would be an interesting take because this idea of people have of social real socialist or social realism um, is quite differently handled in Zenica. It's a very layered narrative. Um, and its aesthetics are far, quite far more interesting than a lot of the films made, but also its interplay with kind of the other cinematic heritage is really beautiful. So it's a very important film. Um, also because one of the directors, Zivanovic, would also be a kind of important filmmaker for the new Yugoslav film. So it's really an interesting kind of, um, it gives you some kind of, I think, the nuanced context that um, was happening in the filmmaking of the time. Um, the Ninth Circle, I had said, uh, I would say a film like Dance in the Rain, which was again recently voted the greatest Slovenian film ever made. Um, it's uh, really a noir and it's a kind of more just, um, it shows Ljubljana in a different light and it's just a kind of classical, in a way a classical film, but also a new wave film. So, and, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but this, this film is key because it's, that year was kind of the year that essentially the new Yugoslav film, in a way the new wave, um, emerges. If you can say with these two films, one is the Hladnik film, which I hope you saw, and the other one is a Petrovic film called And Love Has Vanished. Uh, we didn't include this in the program, but we went for Hladnik, but there's another Petrovic film in the retrospective. Uh, the final couple of films, uh, it includes three, which is, this is, uh, the next are really landmarks of new Yugoslav film or Black Wave, um, which is particularly in the later period known as. Um, and these include three, which is a triptych, uh, and I hope again you saw it, and we're gonna play it a little later um, when we actually start discussing the scenes and how um, it constructs its aesthetics. Then, uh, yes, and a Makaveya film, his first feature film, Man is Not a Bird, um, in which I wanted to kind of also shift our focus a bit because people often, when they hear, hear about Makaveya, everybody knows Mysteries of the Organism or Sweet Movie or the stuff he makes abroad. But um, nobody, well, not nobody, but it's often very rare that people have an idea of his early work that he does in Yugoslavia. And I think it's nice to see kind of this social experimentation and kind of um, his play with also psychological and sexual reality come out. Um, and it also connects nicely as kind of by Sergio's recommendation with Zenica because uh, it's a good, uh, it's kind of that factory setting again, but totally turned on its head. So, um, and then finally, I think also we have finally The Ambush, which is a nice film I wanted to end with. For me, it's Zika Pavlovich is really, the, for me, the most radical of the filmmakers. Um, and Makaveev once said that it's from Zika's films that you really see, you get the term, the black wave. So, um, and it was, um, and I mean, yes, so his film, I hope you get a chance to see it, has not been shown yet. Um, it's going to be shown, I think, tomorrow. Um, so that's the last film on the program. And it also, in a way, I said this also in the catalogue, it's kind of a film that's a tipping point because after 1969, you have films like Mysteries of the Organism and really the black wave kind of being bunkered, as it were. And by bunkered, what I mean is simply films were put away, shelved, not shown. Um, sometimes a very interesting context. They were never officially banned. Um, but they, you just couldn't see them. Um, and then finally, before we get into discussion with Sergio as a kind of overview, which I hope is helpful, I included also short films to give you an idea of kind of the really the hybridity and kind of rich, um, diverse nature of production in the country. And Dimitrios Manli is also a filmmaker that kind of leaves a kind of mark uh, of the new wave filmmakers, but in the context of South in, in the Yugoslav Macedonia. Um, and so this wonderful short film is like a children's film, but it, it also speaks to like conscience. So it's a kind of nice interplay. Um, and then a film that takes that even further in a really dark context is Man Without a Face. And this is literally where you have a narrator as a voice of conscience in a way, uh, which I hope you saw Bato Cengic's film, which is another great filmmaker. Um, and then finally, Jao Mirzilnik, who I'm sure you're familiar with because um, his, he's been, uh, thankfully, of many of the New Wave filmmakers that sadly left us, Zilnik is still one that's very active, makes films, uh, you know, um, does retrospectives, including Harvard and uh, London, and uh, he, he's a very active uh, director and still nowadays, and he's made over, I, d I don't know how many, a lot of films. Um, but uh, yes, this one was one of his early shorts and it kind of gives you an idea of kind of his spirited experimentation, his concern for people who are really on the margins of society. Um, and this is a really a beautiful um, piece of work, I think. Um, but if, if we can kind of start perhaps our conversation with Sergio, 
uh, and speak about this. Sergio, what do you think, in a, in a first and foremost, uh, tell us a little bit about your kind of background interest in Yugoslav cinema and this classical period, why you think it's um, so important and perhaps then we can connect later to the new wave. Okay, as you know, I speak in Italian, mm -hmm. I prefer to speak in Italian. Eh, io ho apprezzato molto i criteri della scelta di Mina Radovic, sia eh, nella scelta dei singoli film, perché eh, vi assicuro che è particolarmente difficile su una cinematografia che è stata talmente ricca di autori, di opere importanti, scegliere otto lungometraggi e tre cortometraggi, eh, cercando anche di mantenere la rappresentanza eh, del maggior numero di autori, quindi un solo film per ciascuno, eccetera. E l'ho apprezzata particolarmente perché secondo me sottolinea quel rapporto che è insieme di continuità e frattura tra gli anni 50 e gli anni 60. Eh, io credo che eh, il nuovo cinema che in altre cinematografie può sottolinearsi con aspetti di maggior rottura rispetto al cinema precedente, metti il cinema francese, in un certo modo anche il cinema italiano, anche se la cosa sarebbe molto più duttile, io credo che nel cinema italiano negli anni 50 vi siano fermenti vitalissimi di quello che avviene poi negli anni 60, però questo nel cinema jugoslavo è particolarmente presente e eh, voi potete vedere che alcuni degli autori che sono attivi addirittura già dagli anni 40 come Stiglitz o dagli anni 50 come i tre autori di Tris Godbe che eh, avete potuto vedere ieri sono poi fortemente presenti negli anni 60 talvolta i registi che hanno esordito negli anni 60 hanno, e eh, anche lì, anche in Jugoslavia, visto una distanza generazionale, di, eh, soprattutto di eh, minor condizionamento ideologico, partitico, eccetera. Ma eh, nel cinema jugoslavo si crea una sorta di modulazione di temi che... Eh, arriva a un punto particolarmente alto tra la metà degli anni 60 e eh, la fine degli anni 60 e eh, purtroppo il vero elemento di frattura è quello che avviene con eh, quello che ha già detto Mila, Mina, la pro proibizione di fatto di questo cinema che per un po' si riusciva a fare ma restava nei cellari eccetera purtroppo qui ad esempio non si è potuto presentare un film perché c'è un problema di copia ma eh, che per me è particolarmente importante un film del 1968 Sveti Pesak di Miroslav Antic che è l'unico film che tocca direttamente il eh, tema di Goliotok, il campo di concentramento jugoslavo, ma non è un film straordinario solo per questo, lo è per la forza di cinema che contiene, perché eh, si è potuto, mi fa piacere dirlo in quest'anno del centenario di Pasolini, si è potuto dire in Jugoslavia, visto che Anti c'era prima che cineasta, anche poeta, che eh, la cosa a cui più fa pensare l'ingresso nel cinema di Miroslav Anti, c'è cioè proprio l'ingresso nel cinema di Pierpaolo Pasolini, quindi con una forza sua che riscrive le regole del cinema. E questo riscrivere le regole di, di tutto il cinema è qualcosa che è avvenuto nel cinema jugoslavo degli anni Sessanta in modo fortissimo, solo in parte riconosciuto a livello internazionale, perché è vero che certi film in realtà vivevano solo grazie ai festival internazionali, Venezia, Berlino, Pesaro, che ha avuto il merito di 
presentare il primo film di Makaveev, eh, eh, che in Italia poi, eh, a differenza dei suoi film successivi, non è, non è stato edito in sala, il film che si vede qui, però è stato rivelato dal festival di Pesaro, a livello internazionale direi, è stato rivelato da questo, ed essendo il film che forse contiene la più forte energia di quello che è questo cinema, ma Kadeev, che purtroppo non è più con noi, parlava molto sempre di energie, eh, dall'energia dall organica di Weir, ma anche l'energia dei cineasti, e lui ha portato nel cinema jugoslavo un'energia fortissima, è stato anche un grande critico, uno che ha, ad esempio, ha riconosciuto nel terzo episodio di Tris Godbe, che avete visto ieri, uno dei grandi film jugoslavi è stato è, e ovviamente il rapporto che c'è con Zenitz a un film degli anni 50 non ne ha fatto inconsapevole un film come, come il suo. Quindi eh, è un cinema eh, che secondo me, nonostante sia stato poi oggetto delle retrospettive curate da me a Trieste, a Venezia, eccetera, che erano molto ampie, addirittura una retrospettiva triennale al Trieste Film Festival, dove abbiamo presentato in tutto qualcosa come 200 film, però è tuttora un cinema che va scoperto nella sua bellezza e forza, che è tra le maggiori a livello internazionale. Sono stato troppo lungo, forse, I have been too, too long. No, that's, that's wonderful. I think you gave a lot of good context also for these films. And um, I, I kind of wanted to ask you now, because I, before we show one of the clips, uh, if you tell us a little bit about Three Stories, because you touched upon it, and it's one film that's very difficult to find for people who don't come to this festival or otherwise. Um, and if you, you touched upon Three Stories there, so if you tell us a little bit more, if you can, about its significance, um, and then how it connects to some of the films we see later in the kind of this classical period, such as Zenitsa or... Um, yes. Ma eh, Tris Godbe è appunto un film che appartiene apparentemente anche a livello estetico in pieno agli anni 50 a dei cineasti che è vero che sono l'opera prima e riuniscono le loro tre opere prime eh, in un lungometraggio, questo era in qualche modo un trucco che è avvenuto successivamente anche nel cinema serbo perché vi sono due grandissimi film Capi Voderatnici e Grad che riuniscono tre cortometraggi e anche un film del croato Martinez era candidato a entrare in questo trittico eccetera e eh, sono dei registi appunto all'opera prima però con una formazione in qualche modo legata al cinema più tradizionale il regista del film dell'episodio centrale che io amo in qualche modo particolarmente Igor Pretnar è un regista che si è formato alla scuola di cinema sovietica e, eh, e questi, questi registi utilizzando tra l'altro fonti letterarie in qualche modo collegate al realismo socialista sì, in, in, in Jugoslavia per fortuna si parlava più di realismo to court, però appunto per eh, in qualche modo sottolineare il parallelismo a cui sto pensando, hanno saputo estrarre da queste fonti delle, eh, delle pure manifestazioni di eh, già eh, cupezza, di nerezza, di, eh, di, di puro slancio romantico verso i destini dell'uomo, che è quello che poi entra in un modo più organizzato nel cinema degli anni 60, più organizzato, più sistematico. Però nel cinema jugoslavo mi sembra che questo film in tre episodi sia veramente... Un, un grande film e per questo l'avevo consigliato a Mina e sono contento che abbia accolto, che abbia accolto il suggerimento.
Thank you. Yes, I think this film is um, it's really a nice work because in, and we see like again I said it connects with these like you said it connects with these later films, um, but what you said about I guess social realism as well this is something I wanted to touch upon just because there's this tendency also in uh, three stories or actually when we talk about historiography people tend to see especially cinemas perhaps they haven't interacted with so much through this prism of social realism or socialist realism and they often mean the same thing and don't always have necessarily the nuance or understanding to know you know to particularly um look at things through the prism of the specific context in which these films were made so i uh, my idea is also that in a way if we can when we speak about some of these films especially the classical period um, if we can distance ourselves from using terminology such as, because, you know, sometimes we can say classical Hollywood cinema when it comes to, you know, the, a certain kind of film and, you know, Soviet realism or this that we're familiar with. But I think in the Yugoslav context, there's something very different happening. Um, and that's why it's kind of, even when we speak about it, it's useful to kind of look at these nuances as we, as we looked at through these films. So, and even a film like Three Stories, which, you know, has some of this really realism, or we can even say perhaps naturalism, there's something interesting very there, uh, very much there. But if we go further in a film like Zenitsa, which is, I mean, a film about a factory, but nonetheless, it has this very layered narrative where it tells you about, you know, the different kinds of people that, li that live in the society, this also shift between um, kind of urban and rural, rural. Um, and and it's also a love story. I mean, but it's not a tr it's not really a, like a classical love story because it's you know it becomes at one point it kind of diverges and becomes a story about the factory, about the people, and then it comes back at the end with the love story. So it's a really kind of nice and nuanced narrative, um, but it also has this setting that makes it very much you know you know uh, of this period. So, but I think if we can kind of transition perhaps to look at uh, some of the films that perhaps focus on the war. Um, and before we talk about them, it'd be nice maybe to show a clip, but just last thing I'll say before we show the clip, um, for a film like, films like Don't Look Back My Son, uh, Branko Bauer is really like, for me, one of the, really the greatest artists that emerges after the Second World War, and he's a person who has really a direct influence for the new Yugoslav film with some of his later 60s works, but Don't Look Back My Son is, I think, a good example of like his kind of heyday of the 50s. Um, and also his approach, it shows you his approach um, to characters, to dramaturgy, it shows you how he handles war, and this partisan narrative that was quite familiar, um, but connects it with looking at atrocities, and in this case, you know, even genocide. So, um, and that's taken even further with a film like The Ninth Circle, which takes you into the camps, and it, d it doesn't do it lightly, because the, th the thing is with the camps, we, we have all, I'm sure, seen a lot of Holocaust films, or if we haven't, we're fam familiar with them, but this film does something quite different. Uh, and the fact that it's, uh, it's, it's narrative is, you know, quite, it seems classical at the beginning, but then these moments, so again, our colleague had highlighted how we see Zagreb, you know, I'm sure <laughs> if you've never been to Zagreb and you see this um, kind of film, <laughs> it's not going to give, well, it might actually give the best impression, but in terms of uh, aesthetically, um, but uh, otherwise, no, because it's obvious, it's obviously showing something quite um, destructive, claustrophobic. Um, yes, but it would be nice to show a clip from the film in terms of showing this transition into seeing how it portrays, um, well, atrocities, the Holocaust, um, and this moment when even this classical or so-called classical cinema becomes even more radical. So if we can have the first clip, please. Evo nas gdje čurljivo, da se malo provozam u autom, a? Onda? Tko će prvi? No? Who go first? Što je? Zdra se nikome ne voze. <laughs> Možda ćemo kuć? <laughs> Ajde. Mm -hmm. No? Ajde. Dosta, dosta, ne može više. Samo mi ništa ne brinite. Svi ćete doći na red. 
Doći ću ja i povan. Vidiš, ima ponekad i veselih trenutaka. Yes, so um, a clip like this, which shows you, I mean, how it approaches, it actually doesn't show you anything in terms of actually what happens physically, but it all is through a kind of, um, uh, by, by, well, by suggesting. Um, and this moment with the children as well, we were having an interesting discussion through the festival. Se um, a colleague had said that about uh, Stieglitz directed this film. If Bauer had done it, who made the Don't Look Back My Son, it would have been different. And then I thought, this scene is one where I think they would agree because you see this moment really um, of kind of um, the nuance of how it shows it in this kind of children who are trustworthy, even in a place that is essentially like hell shown as, because there's another moment in the film where that's also quite powerful, where the one of the um, prisoners says, you know, I, uh, she's probably in the ninth circle, where in the camp. So, um, and th so this, how um, Stiglitz constructs the narrative and this moment I think is quite significant, but perhaps Sergio, you can tell us a little bit more about Stiglitz and how you think we talked a little bit about the kind of traditional representations, uh, but uh, perhaps these moments just kind of shift into the more, we, we can say a bit more radical um, and looking at kind of the history, what, what you would say perhaps about this scene, but also Stiglitz's work and in particularly the Ninth Circle. Yes, uh, uh, Stiglitz uh, è particularly significativo all'interno del, dei criteri di scelta di questa retrospettiva, perché è addirittura il regista del primo lungometraggio sloveno. Nel 1947 ha fatto la sua Isemli sulla propria terra e eh, due anni dopo una sorta di sequel che eh, si intitola Thirst Trieste e eh, rappresenta in qualche modo il momento di formazione di queste eh, cinematografie perché sin dagli, dagli inizi eh, pur essendoci stata una maggiore centralizzazione nel cinema jugoslavo comunque c'è stata una presenza fortissima in tutte le repubbliche in tutte le terre che costituivano la Jugoslavia secondo me eh, eh, è necessario parlare e mi fa piacere che si torni a parlare di cinema jugoslavo senza dover mettere quell'ex davanti che non dice nulla e eh, allo stesso tempo eh, vedere eh, l'estrema ramificazione interna in, eh, dentro il cinema jugoslavo per cui tutti i territori, tutte le nazionalità avevano la possibilità di fare il proprio cinema anche con spostamenti interni. La cosa interessante è che appunto Stiglitz, dopo aver realizzato i primi film sloveni, si sposta all'interno del territorio di Oslavo, fa due film in Macedonia, bellissimi, fa questo film in Croazia, parlato quindi in croato, così come i film macedoni erano parlati in macedone, e lo fa con una possibilità, una capacità di mantenere sia i propri caratteri di regista sloveno, per cui quando c'è nei film macedoni il momento della canzone in cui si dice che eh, gli uomini vengono nel, nel freddo e della, eh, il canto che li riscalda si collega moltissimo ai film precedenti sloveni del suo cinema. E quando arriva al, a un film croato come questo realizza secondo me uno dei momenti più forti dentro dentro il cinema jugoslavo. Eh, eh, io voglio sottolineare in questo anche un rapporto nel cinema jugoslavo. Nel momento in cui eh, Stiglitz realizza il nono cerchio, in parallelo in Jugoslavia Gillo Pontecorvo realizza Capò. Sarebbe molto bello vedere questi due film insieme per cogliere sia i rapporti col territorio che c'è all'interno, sia eh, anche di 
parlare liberamente e senza più il bisogno né di discenderlo né di attaccarlo come c'è stato più volte il capò ecco, eh, eh, mi sembra che il cinema jugoslavo abbia più volte avuto la capacità di collegarsi con dimensioni internazionali un altro cineasta che ha realizzato ben tre film in Jugoslavia italiano che ha realizzato ben tre film in Jugoslavia è il grandissimo Alberto Lattuada quindi il cinema jugoslavo non solo perché c'era la eh, facilità di trovare eh, a, a, a costi ridotti la possibilità di gi girare in location che potevano essere utilizzate anche per altre ambientazioni, ma anche per una, un, una capacità realmente di, reale di relazionarsi col cinema di fuori che forse non è stata colta abbastanza perché in qualche modo del cinema jugoslavo, del cinema jugoslavo è rimasta un po' l'idea di un balcanismo che è solo l'aspetto più superficiale di questo cinema mentre c'è una capacità di spingere agli estremi cose che ci sono anche in altre cinematografie ecco a mio avviso è il cinema indubbiamente capace di arrivare a delle punte di eh, pessimismo, di durezza, di nerezza, particolarmente spinte senza che questo sia mai un, una sorta di cliché, è veramente una riflessione sui destini dell'uomo, è sorprendente che sia stata svolta in modo così libero e onesto, questo il potere politico veramente non l'ha capito. Io sono, sono convinto che eh, la Jugoslavia abbia deciso la sua estinzione e il suo progressivo declino all'inizio degli anni 70, quando c'è stata la repressione censoria verso gli artisti e i cineatti in particolare. Era uno dei, delle, una delle cinematografie più belle del mondo che parlavano con forza e onestà anche del proprio paese sono stati visti come dei nemici questi cineasti costretti all'esilio eccetera e eh, in qualche modo lì eh, il socialismo jugoslavo ha perso la sua anima e un film come, eh, come questo di cui abbiamo visto la clip è secondo me un film che eh, rivela anche in un'inquadratura co come questa la capacità di parlare di un tema come l'olocausto in modo ancora più forte di come siamo abituati a riconoscerlo in film internazionali. Thank you. You brought up two excellent points and that's one of them is about the how Yugoslav films well were perceived but also this idea that you know the cinema itself branched out and was very rich in its representation. So this is one of the reasons I selected, the, I did the program in this way, because some, you know, some people might decide just to do a coverage of the classical period or just the new wave or black wave. And then, um, and I thought it's more useful to see kind of um, the thread and to connect some of these films. And this is again, I hope you saw if you could see many or even all of the films. Um, and then even in that, in a way, snippet, because many more films were produced, you have an idea of the kind of the range of productions, both geographically, but also thematically and in many different ways. Um, and what you said also about dealing with an open eyes, this connects us and can take us now nicely to look at the new wave or the new Yugoslav film, which emerges. Um, it's, it's that sobriety of looking at um, kind of both history, but also the society. Um, and this is particularly unique to Yugoslavia. And I think it's also important because in a time now after Yugoslavia, and where we also have you know, all kinds of different um, re re interpretations and um, even historical revisionism, it's important to see how even films like Don't Look Back My Son and The Ninth Circle um, and many other films critically dealt with their country's history and particularly a dark period of the history such as World War II, such as fascism and such as this genocide and the Holocaust and did that and it's also important that the, a lot of these films were also produced in Yadran film in, uh, in Zagreb in Croatia because that shows you a critical conscience that emerged immediately after the war which people don't often don't know about in a kind of as uh, Sergio had rightly said um, uh, if they haven't approached or seen some of these films people are often familiar with the later works but it's important to note this thread um, I think it's a good point to kind of shift to uh, looking at the new Yugoslav film and kind of for 
For clarification, Yugoslav film is this, uh, in a way, it's a um, period when uh, many filmmakers and artists emerge um, whose aesthetics are in a way radically different and who um, also touch subjects which, you know, weren't addressed at almost at all before and in some ways adapt settings um, but turn them, in, uh, turn them completely upside down. I gave the example of Makaveev. Um, but also there are films which um, in, uh, kind of conduct innovations both in terms of their aesthetics and dramaturgy and in particular they're um, highlighted by their really existentialism and kind of even showing characters propensity towards death and destruction but they always have a hope and this is what's interesting about them there's always this tension um, that's present in the films uh, and that's why I think they received also the term black because a lot of like uh, Later, that's uh, later in the 60s, there's a, it was in an article by Vladimir Jovicic in Borba in Belgrade that called it, you know, the Czerny Val, National Film of the Black, in a way I would say even hole in our film. And I love the, that expression, and in a way is a black hole because it's this idea, you know, and, uh, and, that, and this was also very nuanced because, you know, one important thing to note before we talk about the films is that these films weren't produced by small collectives on a small scale. They were often produced by the major studios. So like um, Avala film produced almost all of Petrovich's and Makaveev's films. And you know, and at the same time, they were producing like partisan films, big <coughs> epics, um, and yes, and, but there were also a range of studios. So in other films, uh, uh, production companies included Films Karad Nazarnica, like a community of film workers, uh, which was also, um, uh, which produced a lot of Zhivoyim Pavlovich's films, um, and many others kind of across the different cities, and the kino clubs as well. That's another important thing to say that we didn't touch upon. Cine clubs were also production houses, so like a, a place like Kino Club Bel Belgrade, uh, a lot of, w uh, from which many of these filmmakers emerged. Um, they also produced some of their films, their shorts, but also their features. Um, so it's a, fa it's a fascinating period, and, and the other thing is a lot of people saw them, so this is the other thing, they were bunkered as we, we, we speak about that, but often not, not immediately um, and in very different ways. If I give just one example that I heard from Zielnik himself, when he showed early works which won at um, Berlin, you know, the Golden Bear, um, and it was shown in Yugoslavia, and in, in Belgrade alone I think a ha several hundred thousand people saw it in the span of a couple of months, and then sometime shortly after that, um, he, you know, he, he was called out by Avila Film and the film was shelved because Tito had seen it and had wondered what, what are these people talking about. <laughs> he hit it pretty much. And uh, Zionik is very lively and, you know, he, he reco recounts these things with vivid detail. Um, and, but the other thing is also to say that a lot of them also won big awards. So a film like Three, it won a Kalavivari. Many of them were nominated for Oscars. Um, and also the major um, film festival in the country, the Pula Film Festival, Yugoslav Films, which is in, in, on the coast of Croatia. Um, most of these films won the awards, so um, I including a lot of Pavlovich's films, Petrovich's films, um, and many others. We hadn't mentioned another important filmmaker, Mladomir Purisha Djordjevic, who, who has an incredible body of work ranging from the 40s up until now. He's still alive. He's 98. It's, you know, so, um, but it's really this, just to, to kind of t take these nuances apart and to see that these films, this was a very hybrid movement, and although films were shelved, you know, they had a very different life. Um, and I think the international part often did have an impact because Zika Pavlovich in particular, uh, there was often the case that if his film was shown abroad at a big festival and did well, then it would be shown and accepted very well in Yugoslavia, which was interesting, whereas it, vice versa, a film like The Ambush, which wasn't, well, it was shown at Venice, but uh, yes, which uh, when they came from domestically, it often had a very difficult kind of, um, uh, even reception, or it was handled, in <laughs> and it had a very difficult li uh, life as a film. Um, but if we speak just about, we can make, perhaps move to uh, Place Videju and Three. Uh, what, uh, Sergio, is it about perhaps Hladnik and Petrovic that's interesting and uh, their aesthetics? I connect them because also Petrovic's other film came out at the same year as Hladnik. So they're both kind of very important for this emergence of the new wave or the new Yugoslav film. Um, and I, if you could tell us a little bit more about what you think is significant in their work, uh, respectively, but also the kind of connections. Sì, dir dirò prima una cosa per sottolineare quello che ha detto eh, Mina eh, rispetto al fatto che il termine di onda nera, zernivale o zernitalas eh, in realtà è nato da un giudizio denigratorio dei nemici di questo cinema che poi è stato accolto con orgoglio giustamente da questi film, che no, da questi registi che non si vergognavano del fatto di sottolineare 
la nerezza nella realtà dei rapporti umani e sociali. Allora, eh, prima che il cinema, eh, che, che veramente manifesta in pieno, al di là delle anticipazioni che ci sono già negli anni 50, come ho detto prima in Tris Godbe, che manifesta in pieno questi caratteri, c'è all'inizio degli anni 60 un, eh, un manifestarsi di una linea più, eh, diciamo, genericamente modernista e eh, più genericamente di poetica d'autore, eccetera, che è rappresentata soprattutto dai, dai due registi che hai detto. Eh, appunto nel cinema serbo eh, Sasha Alexander Petrovic eh, e eh, nel cinema eh, sloveno pur essendo Hladnik un regista che comincia a realizzare i eh, lungometraggi solo in quel periodo diciamo ha eh, all'inizio fortemente questa connotazione benché nei suoi film eh, ci siano già eh, eh, elementi fortissimi di nerezza eh, è interessante soprattutto dentro l'opera di Petrovic il fatto che dopo Dvoje un film che eh, eh, apparteneva in pieno a questa dimensione di ricerca modernistico poetica vi siano i film che eh, eh, realmente sottolineano una nerezza, secondo me Dani soprattutto, ed è, e non è un caso che lì entri nel suo cinema eh, come direttore della fotografia, perché oltre ai registi questa cinematografia ha avuto anche altri creatori straordinari, un, un direttore della fotografia che non è omonimo come può essere a orecchie. Eh, non abituati a scrivere, Alexander Petkovic, che diventa eh, direttore della fotografia di Petrovic per Dani e poi continua a, a collaborarvi nei film successivi. Quindi c'è una eh, estetica nera che si forma dentro Petrovic in modo forse meno determinato anche con la sua voglia, ma lo dico in modo positivo perché era un personaggio secondo me ammirevole in questa eh, ricerca di nuove aperture, ad esempio lui ha supervisionato come eh, insegnante alla scuola di cinema eh, il film che poi ha fatto precipitare addosso al cinema jugoslavo eh, tutte le condanne ideologiche plastici Isus di Stojanovic, un film che viene realizzato come film di diploma eh, dell'insegnamento dell di Petrovic. Quindi Petrovic ha una reale volontà di creare delle aperture, talvolta in modi anche superficiali, nelle forme delle coproduzioni, lui è ad esempio il regista di Maestro e Margherita, il Maestro e Margherita e questo proprio nel periodo finale dell'Onda Nera che non è a mio avviso un film particolarmente felice ma al di là di questi, eh, di questi puri così eh, abbandoni alla ricerca di nuovi contatti internazionali, poi ha avuto un periodo di esilio in Francia durante il quale ha cercato di realizzare un film dal massimo classico letterario serbo, serbo migrazioni di Zernianski, eccetera. È un regista che non è stato particolarmente amato dagli altri, anche perché era un personaggio difficile. Paolo Vice Maccavei praticamente non si parlavano con lui, diciamo chiaramente. Dentro il cinema Jugoslavo, come dentro forse tutte le cinematografie, ci sono state anche delle storie di forti inimicizie. Ma eh, in questa costellazione in realtà ciascuno ha potuto portare 
avanti la propria forza, non c'è mai, mai stato un momento di, eh, in cui questo abbia eh, ridimensionato il lavoro degli altri e eh, purtroppo il ridimensionamento è avvenuto quando c'è stata questa ossessione censoria all'inizio degli anni 70. Eh, Mina ha detto anche molto giustamente che erano le maggiori case di produzione che producevano questi film, ma allo stesso tempo si formarono anche delle altre case. Così come in Slovenia in parallelo alla Triglau Film si è formata la Biba Film e, eh, e i Kino Club sia a Sarajevo che eh, a, 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 a Belgrado a, hanno cominciato a realizzare film in coproduzione con le case maggiori, si è formata però addirittura una casa di produzione nella Repubblica Autonoma della Vojvodina, eh, la Neoplanta Film, che diventa praticamente una casa specializzata in cinema nero. E, 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 e la Neoplanta Film che produce Sveti Pesak, per esempio, che produce i film di Gilnik, che era voivodinese, che è voivodinese, eccetera, e coproduce eh, l'ultimo Makaveev realizzato in territorio jugoslavo, Ver, e eh, eh, facendone una proiezione a inviti a Novisat, molto ben documentata da un recente documentario, che eh, secondo me Sveto Zarudovicki, il produttore della Neoplanta, è un altro di questi eroi segreti di questo cinema che hanno eh, giocato in pieno sulla possibilità di fare le cose finché si potevano senza preoccuparsi di quello che succedeva dopo e di fatti dopo sono stati accantonati e non hanno più, potuto più fare nulla. E non so se ho risposto, Mina, a quello che mi chiedevi, però ho detto alcune cose a cui ci tenevo. Thank you, Sergio. That's wonderful. What you said there as well, I'm grateful you pointed out the construction of new companies such as Viva Film, which are very important, and you know, even films like mysteries of the organism and so on, they have a big role. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that, yes, there's this part where we see the, the, the directors had very strong characters, um, but there was also collaborations because, you know, Zilnik, like co-director, worked on many of Makaveev's films before he did his own. Um, and one interesting thing is that Zilnik, to this idea of black film, reacted very strongly, and he even made a film called Black Film as a response to kind of this reception of, um, it's a short that he made in the early 70s, but um, as a response to the reception of all their work. Um, but Perhaps we can show, because I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, yes, would like to show a part of three, but before I do that, just to speak about, kind of to perhaps summarize in a way, the aesthetics that these, many of these new filmmakers brought forward. Um, it includes this, um, I would say, kind of really um, new and radical approach to composition, to camera work, to, to music, to editing, um, and this really focus on people who are neglected, socially um, rejected, poor, and people really on the edges of society. And as I said before, What is really unique about these films is that, as, as a new wave as a whole, is that they really have this existential dimension that's articulated often as even a voice of conscience, but that often also shows the darkness um, and uh, it's a propensity towards death, towards destruction, self-destruction. But at the same time, and this is where, the, where they're also the originality comes, that show hope and that they give strength, but that also have a deep simplicity. And two examples of that, I won't show this, but two examples of that is if you saw three, you have that moment where uh, Stola Arangelovic comes with, um, with the cross and uh, screams repent as a kind of moment of, as a calling to all the characters in the midst of the madness that's going on. Um, and also another one is the ambush. I do not wish to ruin the film for you, but if you haven't seen it, but this moment where the main character says, some revolution you are, it's like a cry um, uh, really of simplicity for, of, of humanity um, that to, to restore what is lost. Um, and it's almost like a childlike cry. 
Um, and this, because I don't want to leave out speaking about the short films, which are wonderful, because Dimitrios Manley had a great um, kind of um, career in Yugoslavia and made excellent feature films, such as Memento, Bato Cengic as well, made a wonderful film called Little Soldiers, and many others, but that one is particularly kind of in this context, very black film. I didn't actually include it because I thought quite a lot of the films are heavy, and if I went all heavy, it would have been <coughs> one kind of experience. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, these short films give you an idea of kind of, um, on the one hand, there's a really simple child-like film uh, that's The Rebellion of the Dolls, um, and that shows this call for, you know, the call of conscience to be a child and not to be malicious and not to be like this. And it's a very fascinating work um, and really but original. Um, and then at the same time, you have a film like Man Without a Face that materializes that, as I had said before, like the voice of conscience as a narrator. And, you know, we look at the prison, but then we, you know, he interrogates them. It's almost like unnerving the fact that, you know, he, there are these prisoners and he doesn't, you know, he, it doesn't let up. It, like asks, you know, what a, it literally go, it into, goes into their psyche, which is sometimes quite uncomfortable but it distances us from them as well because we do not see, um, we do not see the face, right? Um, finally, before I guess we show the next clip, it's also good to say that these filmmakers, although connected, they also had a very, you know, each of them had their own path and formed an incredible body of work in their own right um, and also influenced many filmmakers and generations to come. I mean, if you've heard of the kind of new Yugoslav or the like later gener generation that comes after them, sometimes they're called the Prague School for filmmakers like Goran Markovic, uh, Paskalevic, uh, Rajko Grlovic, and um, um, uh, yes, and others, Vladan Zafranovic as well. And, Yes, and these filmmakers all went to FAMU uh, in Prague in the 60s, and you have an in in, in excellent account in Goran Markovic's book, um, uh, The Czech School Does Not Exist, as a kind of reference to this, you know, the way they've been, um, in a way, labeled by f many film historians. Um, you have an account of how, at the time when they were in Prague, you know, Petrovic, his films, like I Even Met Happy Gypsies, was the main film playing in Prague, and everybody wanted to be Bekim Fechmu, and, you know, this, this idea of kind of this vibrancy of the film culture, and also this exchange that was happening with Czechoslovakia and many other countries countries. So, but to give an idea of the, the kind of aesthetics I mean in a snippet of two minutes, um, I will show, and I hope many of you have seen it, but uh, a clip from three, please. Hey, kume, doveri tu meč ko vam, ne pokaže šta zna. Ajde, Marko, mušterija. Sjeta stari djeva, jano, kad Marko je u glavu. Skociganska korita. Tiše, ne napadaj vojsku. A šta tiše, to je izdaja.
Y este bit. Thank you. I, I noticed this when I watched it. I'm grateful to our, our colleagues at the El Cinema Ritavato because it's so painful to watch on the big screen, and particularly in the cinema. Um, but it gives you an idea. I didn't mention, of course, Roma communities, which particularly in Petrovic's film that I even met Happy Gypsies is about, and also feature in a lot of his other work. But I love this scene as a kind of summary, and also for me it's even more pure poetry how he connects this moment with the bear and the soldiers, and what's interesting is that he doesn't create enemies, although at first we do not sympathize with the soldiers that laughs at the bear and, and the Roma um, uh, performers. Uh, at the same time, we have this transition suddenly when they play, uh, and the m train is moving away, and you know these people are probably going to their death, and you will never see them again. So it's a fascinating scene, the way it shows the pain of the bear, but it also shows the pain of the people at the same time. Um, but it, uh, at the same time, it gives us the possibility of transcendence with the music and with the way it kind of connects the, the instruments. So uh, I, I wanted to ask Sergio, because I'm a, um, I realize we have only about under 10 minutes left, um, so I'm, I wanted to ask Sergio one kind of perhaps final question, and I really don't want to leave Pavlovic or Makaveev out. We talked about Makaveev. Uh, perhaps we can connect Makaveev, but particularly speak about a little bit about Zielnik as well, but also Pavlovic, because I think Pavlovic, we don't uh, have a chance to speak so much about Zivoyan Pavlovic, and his film The Ambush is really an incredible work, and including his other work. So, and because he's such an important figure for the, you know, the formulation of the Black Wave <coughs> and even after, because he continues making films in Yugoslavia, yeah. he goes to Ljubljana quite a lot, but perhaps you can take us through that and then I will kind of um, uh, perhaps conclude uh, our kind of um, nice discussion for today. Sì, mi, mi fa molto piacere che mi, mi hai chiesto questo, Mina, perché eh, Paolo Vice è quello che ha ah, in realtà potuto realizzare l'ultimo e anche uno dei più radicali film neri, che non era un film serbo ma un film sloveno, lui ha più volte realizzato mm -hmm. in Slovenia i film, già con eh, uno dei primi lungometraggi, Nepriatel, Sovrashnik come titolo sloveno, e, e, e in, a quando il cinema... Eh, nero o come veniva chiamato critico il cinema dei rompiscatole a un certo punto Gilnik racconta che Tito era esploso eh, del, eh, dopo una proiezione di uno que di questi film eh, dicendo um, ma, chi, ma, ma chi si credono di essere questi cretini eccetera e allora quando eh, i film eh, quelli che erano stati appena realizzati non uscivano perfino dentro il festival di Pola venivano proiettati semmai la mattina e non nell'arena e non si potevano più produrre nuovi film con quegli autori come appunto alla neoplanta di Novi Sad che è stata praticamente completamente cambiata nella dirigenza diventando una sorta di puro, pura casa di produzione territoriale eh, a quel punto eh, eh, Paolovic rispetto alla più duttile Slovenia che eh, in realtà non ha mai avuto queste tensioni così forti a livello di eh, rifiuti, di censure eccetera, ha potuto realizzare nel 72 l'Etmaltwe Ptice il volo dell'uccello a moto, anche quello è stato presentato al festival di Pesaro all'epoca e eh, che secondo me è un film veramente straordinario che meriterebbe di essere riproposto, so che ci sono forti problemi perché i colori di, dei film di quegli anni si deteriorano facilmente ma eh, io credo che esista tuttora anche in Italia una copia con sottotitoli italiani in 35 mm eh, che andrebbe tirata fuori è un, un film che riesce a collegare tra le mani eh, di, un, di, un, di un cineasta anche profondamente serbo, oltre che profondamente jugoslavo come Pavlovic, riesce a realizzare anche uno dei più straordinari film sloveni con un forte pathos 
territoriale slovena con, con l'ambientazione nel, nel settentrionale tra Muri e ai, ai confini con l'Ungheria eccetera e eh, Paolovic appunto era uno che in realtà parlava solo il serbo un po' il sloveno eccetera non avrebbe mai pensato come Makaveyev di andare all'estero era forse anche troppo così stanziale per farlo eccetera ha continuato soprattutto un'attività di scrittore ha continuato a fatica a realizzare dei film in Serbia e di tanto in tanto qualche film in Slovenia tra cui però questo film del 72 costituisce a mio avviso il punto di arrivo del migliore cinema di quegli anni e Gilnik è invece fortunatamente l'unico vitale sopravvissuto del cinema di quel periodo fa dei film tuttora magnifici e credo che prima o poi lo vedrete anche a Bologna visto che è molto presente anche nei festival internazionali Gilni che è quello che è stato più vicino a Makaveyev e eh, che ha e mantenuto un rapporto di amicizia fino alla morte eh, di qualche anno fa di Makadeyev e eh, che ha esordito con un lungometraggio che anche qui sarebbe stato bellissimo vedere Rani Radovi, opere giovanili qui, qui si vede, si è visto ieri il suo cortometraggio che è bellissimo ecco. ma appunto l'idea che può darvi questa retrospettiva di 11 film mi auguro che sia appena l'inizio di un contatto di chi l'ha seguito con questo cinema che va spogliato di tante eh, eh, immagini superficiali di balcanismo eccetera e, e voglio ringraziare ancora una volta Mina per, per averla proposta a Cinema Ritrovato. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you also for participating, because it's an honor to have you here as someone who's, you know, conducted all this years of this research and these incredible, uh, huge retrospectives of Yugoslav film. Um, I'm grateful and to Cinema Ritrovato and all our colleagues that we were able to do this retrospective. It is a uh, also a way I wanted to h give you an, uh, kind of um, an idea of the immensity of the production of the time, but also a sense, so and as a way and a door to further exploration, as you had said. And to finish on two things, I would like to say about Pavlovich to give you an idea of his character and perhaps in a way the character of many of the filmmakers, but what I particularly appreciate about him is that in addition, and many of them did this as well, in addition to their filmmaking, which was incredible, they also were dramatists, writers, I mean authors, um, and also professors. And Zika Pavlovich once said, they said in response to his films being bunkered or put away, and the kind of immense pressure it obviously that create, puts on a person, uh, he said, you know, and it, it would have been enough for him as an artist to have just made two or three films and he would have been already like an incredible artist. Um, and but yet I like this uh, in, in his uh, where he when he wrote this and said you know I could use one of my films as Christ's wounds and just walk around showing them to people and saying you know look at me but I have work to do so this no um, this sober attitude is also something present in the cinema um, and I would like to read a final quote to kind of a, an opening up this archive to from Akavev which is in a nice collection that was done um, by Nikodievich in the 90s uh, 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 called Zabrenjeni bez Zabren, so censored without censorship or banned without being banned. Uh, a collection with all the kind of interviews of the filmmakers who made the, um, really this significant impact on Yugoslav cinema. Um, and I wanted to just also say I'm very glad also Purusha Djordjevic is somehow from this period still as yes. well alive, but he's 98 and it's just incredible. And Micha Popovic, who yes. was painter. <laughs> yes, yes, and th there are some, so yes, but Zionik is definitely the most vital and appears half his age, so I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to, I hope he makes another body of work by the <laughs> in his, still in his lifetime. Uh, but uh, to finish off, I'll read a quote from Akaveev that he wrote about the cinema of the time and it kind of encapsulates nicely what they did and also connects everything we've been speaking about and this whole retrospective. I think in response to um, uh, unbunkering these films and seeing them all in connection with the other films, I think that will be very interesting and this is now quoting Makaveev and I think we will have to do it someday. Uh, we will, it would be good to see the film, set them into groups, and see for ourselves what kind of life it was that we had, which subjects we were concerned with. Through that, I think we would discover that we lived in a country that was very modern, 
A head of countries such as Switzerland that live through different cultures, or Germany, for example, which has said but little about itself through art. Through our films, we said far more about ourselves. We made films about human dramas in a nuanced and rich way. These were honorable productions, which on the other hand shows us that society of the time worked. We had our comedy greats, Aza Popovic, Dusko Kovacevic, outstanding dramatists, writers, good films, distinguished painters. That's the evidence that the society was alive. One day, it will be uncovered that a large-scale operation of the destruction of the country was conducted by specific circles of the former political apparatus. He said this in 1994, and I'm very delighted that after a long time we were able to do this retrospective, and I hope it will open a door for you and us to discover really the, the gem and the, the precious um, pearl that is the Yugoslav cinema heritage. Thank you.